What I'm going to do this morning briefly is um, introduce some critiques of social media research. So I'm not going to critique social media. I'm not going to do platform critique. Um, but I'm going to do research critique. Now, embedded in the research critique will be some, some critiques of you know, Facebook policy or Twitter policy or things like this. But that's not the, the point here. Uh, the point is rather, what are the implications for doing social as well as cultural research uh, when uh, using uh, social media platforms? And um, one of the things that I have been a champion of, uh, starting with the digital methods book that I published in 2013 with MIT, is the notion of repurposing. Uh, so digital methods um, as, a, as an idea uh, was built on the notion of using existing online data that was collected for other purposes and then repurposing it for social research. Now, recently, this particular idea uh, has come under fire. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about why that is um, and not necessarily provide solutions. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about why, why it is that, uh, that, this, uh, that this, this issue of repro repurposing um, uh, online data or traces, the study of digital traces, why that has become problematic. Um, and then perhaps in the discussion we can start talking about what to do about these problems. Uh, but I would just want to put out the problems and open up a discussion. So that's the purpose of uh, what I'm going to do uh, today. So I'm going to touch on five, um, five points, five discussion points. I'd like to talk about um, why it is that social media um, has oftentimes been criticized for, for not being good data. Um, the second one is uh, in reaction to quite a well-known article that, um, that, uh, that Crawford uh, published recently called Where Are the Human Subjects in Big Data Research? Um, so this is part of the ethics turn uh, in, in social media research and in online research more generally. Uh, an ethics turn uh, which uh, goes back, I think, uh, at least a, a decade or so, but really has come uh, to the fore uh, in the last couple of years uh, with, um, especially now in the last couple of days, with this idea of uh, Facebook um, being held accountable for ha having a researcher uh, harvest something like 50 million uh, profiles which at the time, in 2013 and 2014, as you probably all well know, was perfectly doable. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have done it. Um, I'm not saying that I did. Um, but but this, is, um, this is something that, uh, that is, is now uh, a, a, a extraordinary, has extraordinary uh, attention has been placed on it. The third one, and this has been lurking in the background, this issue, for, for quite some years, um, is the idea of, of uh, social media platforms as proprietary platforms, who's, who have, which has very, very different goals um, than, than research goals. And of course, that's not completely sort of true in the sense of that's, not a, that's a bit, bit black and white, because of course there are many, many data scientists publishing working at these uh, at companies. Um, uh, so and, and a lot of the data that's being collected are, are actually collected uh, for dual purposes. But nevertheless, um, so the fourth one is, is this repurposing issue, which I've already introduced. And then the fifth one is um, some people uh, talk about it um, uh, as, as a viable way forward. Uh, should we be pursuing as researchers alternatives? Um, to um, the current uh, online social media platforms <laughs> for data collection, for our own, uh, for our own research. Um, and what are some of them and what, um, uh, and what are the, what, what can we do with them? Uh, so, okay, let me just start with this idea of good data. Um, the, the first point that's often made in the critique of social media research is that, that platforms, social media platforms are not research instruments. Uh, that, um, that are set up for the purposes of doing research. Uh, so they aren't sensors uh, for um, collecting, I don't know, carbon, carbon dioxide levels in the, in the air. They're not 
sensors for no they're they're set up for something else and 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 if we were to think of them as being uh, interesting in terms of social sensors for social listening, as it's oftentimes called. Uh, what are the problems with doing that? Well, the problems are um, that they are unstable. Uh, so they're not, they're not good data in the sense that the data remains clean or, or the data remains uh, the same over time, the fields. And they're not additive either. Some fields disappear and other fields appear. Uh, and then when they do, there's, then intera there's, there's what you could call interactive complexity in the data collection. So certain data fields that were collected pr previously, likes, are then affected by new data fields that are introduced, reactions. So then if you look at likes over time, you have some issues that need to be resolved. Um, but it's not only that the data fields change, also the metrics, the inbuilt metrics that are used, um, which also uh, could be considered to be data, also change. I don't know if you are familiar with the work of Jonathan Albright at the Tau Center at Columbia, who is the one who uh, looked up the six Russian disinformation pages that were known at the time in uh, last October, uh, blacktivists, uh, um, Heart of Texas, United Muslims of America, these sorts of things. Um, when he uh, researched the amount of uh, interactions on Facebook that these Russian disinformation pages got, uh, what he found was when he was doing uh, the work, the actual metric that was used at Facebook on CrowdTangle itself changed three days later. Um, so it's the metrics also that change. Um, the second one is um, you'll, you'll hear also in the news right now uh, about that, um, that the researchers at Cambridge University, the researcher at Cambridge University uh, who uh, fed uh, one way or another the Facebook data to Cambridge Analytica broke Facebook rules. So if you go to the various platforms, they have various rules. Uh, Twitter rules, that's where the, the term normally comes from. Well, these rules um, are actually don't work so well for, for, for research, for our research. Um, so when uh, Twitter accounts are deleted or suspended, for example, um, that the, the data that we hold uh, that has been uh, deleted on the platform, we're supposed to delete it as well. Uh, and, uh, and then if we don't, we break the rules. Um, so, so, or for example, if I collect suspended tweets um, that were suspended in Germany because they're extremist tweets, and I have them in the Netherlands, uh, it's quite it's it's a bit of a gray area uh, the extent to which I could use them for my research. Um, I, I, I it's a gray area. Um, so we could all say, oh, um, you know, w w we we have no problem breaking these contracts that we uh, enter into um, as we browse or as we um, download data. We do in the past, we did that all the time. Um, but it's, an, it's, a, it's increasingly an issue. The one that oftentimes people don't talk about as much is that privacy, which is normally this thing that's held out as something um, that everyone should respect. Um, well, privacy settings actually kind of sully our data, if you will. So uh, if everyone started to turn up their privacy settings, uh, we would get uh, we would get less less data. Um, so uh, and data becomes uneven because of uneven privacy settings. Um, okay, the second one: human subjects. It's interesting that for a number of years, uh, some researchers would argue whether uh, it's in print or elsewhere, uh, that um, the fact that users have assigned on to terms of service on Twitter, on Facebook, and elsewhere provides a cover for researchers. Because it says um, in the uh, contract that users uh, enter into with so social media platforms, because it says quite clearly and over and over again that this data can be used for not only the improvement of the software 
but also for marketing research and for other research purposes. That this then, then the researchers are thus in the clear. Now, that particular idea of we are complying as researchers has also come under quite some scrutiny recently, um, not only with the, the, the development of particular kinds of ethical guidelines by, for example, the Association of Internet Researchers, but also uh, through a number of, through increasing uh, work in the area of, uh, of ethics as applied to, uh, or data ethics, let's just call it. Um, and uh, there, the, the notions that are being put forward are, are feminist ethics of care um, a, and uh, contextual integrity or contextual privacy, the, the, the notion that was put forward by Helen Nissenbaum. Uh, ethics of care goes back to the 80s, uh, Carol Gilligan and, and uh, others. Um, uh, so, so there's a very, very kind of different sort of ethics uh, being put forward to now um, uh, treat this, the, uh, the treat data. Um, and when we move to the idea of, of uh, uh, an ethics of care or the idea of contextual privacy, which I, I'll say something about in a second, um, uh, these ideas are oftentimes considered incompatible with big data research. Um, so how do you do big data research if you, uh, um, for example, want to respect the contextual privacy of others. Contextual privacy, in this sense, means that the users did not expect uh, their data to be used other than to, to be used out of the context that they uh, were giving it. That is, when you tweet, you don't think of this tweet being then being analyzed by an academic researcher. Um, the third one that people oftentimes don't talk about, which is kind of interesting to me at least, is should uh, social media users be treated not as subjects, well, anyway, they should be treated as subjects, but also as authors. Um, so, should, so if you use their data, are you citing them uh, uh, or quoting? Uh, and it's interesting uh, that uh, when in, in, a, in a Twitter and society volume that was published in 2015, I think it was, um, one particular legal scholar took up this, this question and said, well, well a, a tweet is, should not be considered as being authored because it was not the product of the sweat of one's brow. Uh, so it wasn't authored in, in, a, in a kind of traditional sense of what uh, one considers to be author's work. Um, The question of um, the impact of proprietary uh, um, data or proprietary operations on research, uh, I think is kind of interesting when you talk about social media uh, companies these days. Um, uh, obviously, over the last uh, 10 years or so, um, social media data by the companies have been increasingly commodified. So, so they are increasingly packaged and sold as products. Um, so that much uh, is clear, but that doesn't necessarily interfere with, with uh, um, one repurposing it uh, if one can still get a hold of it. But, but, uh, but the amount of sort of free data or what, or the quality, in particular, of free data, um, <laughs> has waned in comparison with the with the rise of the proprietary data and the price tag on it. Um, so that so that's one impact. Uh, so the quality goes down. Um, the second one is that uh, one could say, okay, uh, but we can go back in time and get the data. Well, um, up until. January of this year, there was this hope that the Library of Congress would hold um, all of the, all of Twitter's uh, archive, um, and um, they announced that they're stopping doing that uh, and they're moving over to a sort of selection policy, uh, sort of curated data sets. Um, so they're no longer holding a complete uh, will hold a complete archive. In any way, they couldn't handle it. Um, so, so no researcher ever 
got access to the Library of Congress uh, Twitter archive, as you probably know. Um, even though um, it was thought that, that it was, would be doable somewhere around t uh, what, 2015. But in any case, um, the, the archives are now currently held by the companies. Uh, and, and of course, those archives are then updated by the companies. Right? So when, when you go to Facebook and you say, Where's the deleted Russian disinformation pages? You can't go to the Library of Congress and say, well, they're in the archive there. They're gone. Um, and, 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 and so this, this becomes a quite a serious, uh, I mean, you, they're, they're gone publicly. Um, so this, is, this becomes quite a, quite a serious issue for academic research. The other one that I want to mention um, is, um, so, so, so science by social media APIs is, are treated like the same way as a, as a marketing company. And then if we get too much data, if we like, try to like, exceed the rate limits, uh, exceed the speed by which you, you're uh, able to collect data, uh, we're, we're treated as a kind of, like a kind of spam, like a spammy case. You know, oh, um, this is a... Uh, um, this is a, like an overzealous marketing organization, or some sort of you know you're breaking you're breaking the terms, um, and and then the, what's in the backs of the minds of the uh, of the company, of course, is is uh, is that people are trying to get the data to resell it. Uh, so so science becomes you know the, the equivalent of a marketing co of, a, of a dubious uh, marketing company, right? So we're spammy, um, and what Twitter recently so. I mean, I've, I, I, I did quite some negotiations uh, as a, a member of the Association of Internet Research with, with Twitter because we use a lot of Twitter data. Other um, academics have as well. Um, and what Twitter has come up with most recently, and they announced it, and, and it broke, I think, probably a lot of people's tools uh, to collecting Twitter data. But anyway, they came out, they rolled out this new model, and now um, <laughs> we're treated um, as um, as uh, consumers of, of a freemium, um, so we can get we can do 50, que 50 historical queries, but uh, but above that, uh, then the price goes uh, goes up. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'll be quick. I'm going over time now. Okay, um, <coughs> repurposing. So the the arguments around the difficulties with um, relying on the, the very idea of, of repurposing um, traces or um, online data collected for other purposes to do social and cu cultural research. Uh, that has been uh, critiqued uh, recently quite forcefully. Um, and one of the, the points that's been made is, is that, well, platforms are in a completely different business. They're not in the business of science. Um, they're in the business of data extraction. They're, in, they're, they're an extraction. They're one of the, the new extraction industries. Um, and they um, don't crowdsource. They crowd fleece. This is a sort of term that uh, Trevor Schultz and others use. They're in the business of crowd fleecing. Um, so this, this idea that, that, um, um, that, that you would rely on an instrument that whose politics are quite problematic um, itself uh, would, be, would, be, would be problematic. It, it's, it's as if you're complicit or, um, or, or normatively um, dubious. Yeah, so this is the critique. Um, and that's very, very different spirit. It's a very, very different set of norms. So I'm, into, I'm talking about kind of <coughs> Mertonian norms or the norms of science. Uh, it's a very, very different set of norms, um, and then the, than what uh, what science uh, uh, what science have. Uh, and they're very and uh, so the second one um, is that um, when we're studying the social. Uh, through the through platform data, we're getting the social via a kind of advertising logics. 
Um, so the platform is built to extract data in order to advertise uh, to, uh, to others uh, rather than for uh, other reasons, like to enhance the public sphere or what have you. Um, and so the, the prism through which you're studying the social is this, is this one. Uh, finally, um, I don't know if this goes, this, this last point goes in this particular uh, points, but I think so. So when we're trying to make, we're really working hard to make social media APIs productive for research, for science, we compromise ourselves. Um, so, I mean, I have, I don't know how many terms of service I've broken, um, and, and um, you know, collecting uh, search engine results, uh, and so you, and then you're you're actively worked against by the by the companies by the so they're actively blocking you. Uh, so the more they block you, of course, the more you're like, hmm, let me think of another workaround. Uh, so uh, you're 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 being pushed in a particular way so that so that you're you're in fact I don't know, almost being lured uh, into compromising yourself um, so where do you draw the line uh, as they block and as they limi limit rate limit as uh, etc um, so 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 this is uh, this is this is uh, this is a, a tricky issue okay so I want to just conclude really quickly um, with the question of alternatives, I, I, I don't know if you're um, up on notions of, for example, platform co-ops uh, and others. So there have been a series of uh, proposals put forward um, for, uh, uh, for changing, changing the online landscape um, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first one is that, the, is that it has been observed uh, by Tim Berners-Lee and others that the web is in decline. And one of the major reasons uh, is um, uh, the rise of the, of the social media platform, sort of sucking uh, the, the uh, uh, people in, um, locking them in. Uh, and, you s and the result is a following web. So if you go sector by sector across the web, uh, the non-governmental web doesn't look very healthy. Uh, the governmental web, OK. Commercial web, perhaps OK. Uh, but other ones um, are, uh, so this is more of an empirical question, but this is an observation that I'm making. But uh, the health of the web is an issue. Um, and uh, and uh, so, so a lot of people argue, well, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and we, uh, in, ed in science and education, uh, could be a driving force of, uh, of good uh, for um, a public and an open web versus a proprietary and a closed one. Um, Trevor Schultz, in arguing for this platform cooperativism, um, goes much farther, saying you cannot change. So he doesn't, get, he doesn't uh, sort of buy into the argument that, that users uh, can do, uh, can affect much, much change. You have to own uh, the platforms in order to change it. Uh, the other one is, um, um, so, so should we be doing research on that? So if you compare the amount of articles about alternative social media, or even s what I once called secondary social media, smaller, if you c compare the number of the amount of work being done on that to the amount of work being done on Facebook, I mean, it pales obviously pales in comparison. And then finally, um, some alternatives in our uh, own sector, uh, where um, also. Um, users of uh, academics are users of social media for the academic social media so research gates academia.edu and the rest um, and there are alternatives uh, such as scholarly hub is anyone on scholarly hub anyone okay sorry maybe there are others um, but in any case this is this is something uh, a question um, to be put nowadays uh, to uh, social media research, the critique of social media research, and the critique of social media researchers, I guess, is where this then uh, concludes, um, of whether or not uh, we, uh, as researchers, uh, should s uh, seek to strive to research and also promote alternatives. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>